Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and take on various topics that tend to cross one's path when you go into the forest adventurous and try to communicate with images. So we think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Droz. I'm a cartoonist and a teaching artist, and the other host is... Hey, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I'm an interactive designer and a coach for user experience. Good to see you again, Rob. Good to see you, Jersey. And last week, we did a sort of celebration love note to sort of my wheelhouse of comics. And so I thought it'd be fun to flip it, pitch it back to you and go, okay, now let's hear about a topic that I know you've spent a lot of time engaging with and thinking about and, uh, and 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 reshaping your your relationship with over the years, um, this whole thing called UX. Um, mm. Yeah, user experience design. It's a pretty broad space, and coming up with it as far as the growth and popularity of UX, it runs in parallel with my you know my adult career, and so it was. It's not too surprising that that I found you know such great attachment to it and whatnot, and uh, and I think it's especially the general and the sort of there's so many tools and useful things you can you can um, discover and apply depending on where you are where you're at whether you're a um, you know you're tackling your small business uh, concerns where you're wearing lots of hats and you think well um, well thinking systemically about what you're working on w within reason and within the time that you have available to wear this other hat too. There's tools for you there. There's tools for you if, well, this is your main thing or one of your main things where you are providing some service to a larger organization as um, in, in a UX design role, which could vary from things that are very strategy focused and sort of you're set, you're being focused at problems that are um, sort of broader future looking, or are you looking at problems that already exist and that have been partially solved, but that can be refined and improved? And either way, there's still approaches to research and design, problem solve and uh, test ideas collaboratively. Well, I mean, there you go. You just like teed us up so I can just hit the music to take us to the first part of the show. So, or maybe, there we go. There's some music to take us into. The first half, we we, t we usually pick a single topic and then drill down as far as we can on it, but we break it into two chunks. There's like going to be a, uh, we're going to take a break in the middle. Uh, we do a first half where we talk about it in one way, then we do a second half where we talk about it in another way. Before we dive into the, the first. we the go first... this way, then we go that way, you know. Yeah, that was pretty vague, Eventually... wasn't it? Huh? Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm playfully uh, <laughs> stomping over your intro. Excuse well, me. Well, I, I know that. Well, I guess the way we typically talk about it is that we usually say, like, what does it look like when we're engaging with this topic? And then we back away and say, well, how do we think about the, what, this this mm -hmm. topic while we, we're engaged with it? Um, there may be a little bit of a difference this time, depending or given the way that the, the notes are structured. But I do want to ask, I mean, not, not to take us too far afield, and maybe there's a way to address this in a few minutes or less. Um, mm -hmm. You said the growing popularity of UX. Do you have a sense as to why we're so much more aware of it now? Is it just a simple thing that like this is a channel that we're both tuned into um, and the Internet makes all discussions more visible? Or is there something that's happened in the way we do business and think about business and, and creativity that's gotten us thinking more about that? Uh, I... I think there are large events, there are, there's, yes, there's an accumulation of awareness that has happened through a, var a variety of events. One of those being, um, well, the iPhone, the, in right around, uh, what was it? Was it 2008 seven. or so? Yeah. Seven? Somewhere in the neighborhood. Seven or eight. Yeah. Uh, you're right. Six, seven or eight. I forget. Right. And, but it was in right around that time when I, I went um, from working at a large institution and I went independent. Right. So I've gone back and forth with these different uh, modes of, of like, how do I serve and stuff? And it, I mean, it was the iPhone brought such sharp awareness and stark relief, stark comparison between something that was very um, well, maybe you had a lot of features. Maybe you had a lot of options. Phones you know, like Nokia was putting out and, and um, 
let's see, you had uh, uh, personal digital assistants and you had so many features, features, features all over the place, right? But then the iPhone focused a lot of things down and simplified and got rid of a lot of capabilities. It caused surprise and tension and also a ton of conversation because of its, its success. And its, its success and the conversation that followed helped bring awareness to like, what's so different about this product? Are we just being hypnotized or something? And no, it's, it's about, um, it's the, the kind of problem solving and uh, creativity that can happen when you thoughtfully design things in a systemic manner. And the uh, other, other things were popping up around that time too, like popularity of, um, well, small teams trying to create big businesses and stuff, right? And you had bursts of that in the earlier, uh, in the earlier time of of the internet, where it's all the. Um, there was a presentation I saw early or at some point in my career where early on that was the, so hippie, so idealistic. But it was it was um, it was this slide I always wanted to screen capture and credit the source and stuff, but I can't find it anymore. But it was um, this this multidiscipline group that was doing consulting and helping. Um, you know, spread web capabilities. And, it, and it, the, the line on it was, it's the web is where you can't tell the towers from the flowers. And, you know, so uh, I feel stupid saying it, but, but the spirit of that time when it was like anyone could put something out into the world. Yeah. And yep. And things kind of look like that too, but it was this explosion of, of creativity and difference and, and uh, a whole like, uh, delightful chaos of some things sometimes solving problems really well. So, um, but then you, you fast forward to all of a sudden there was this web 2.0. I think a, a little bit of that was that's to, to get credit for people essentially starting to use small teams, solving big problems, and then bringing enough disciplines together to do it well. And if you included design, you probably brought about different solutions than people who weren't including design. And so the story of your success for a given tool or, or solution or web thing or whatever, design, the story of design started to spread. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, and now it's more common for anyone to just comment about the, the look of the aesthetic concerns about things, but also behavior. And what does it feel like when you are, um, because now you're seeing so many things being provided with, uh, adaptable changing user interfaces from uh, ATMs to gas pumps to walking into a store, um, uh, self, uh, self checkout, whatever. I mean, like you can go on and on where we're being uh, constantly exposed to examples of design and various levels of success as far as success and, and, and not as not me as like, I'm a design pundit and watch me, you know, I'm putting on my judgy cape and I'm flying in here. I come. Watch out, everyone's UI. I'm not that kind of guy, but because I think there's a fitness thing, and, and like if it's fit and solving the problems for that audience, great. Uh, the dialogue with, with, is, kind of, is popping up. What, what do you think? I mean, you've well, seen this. Do you? How does that resonate with you? Like, well, I, I I immediately thought of something that's been happening. So I I live near a Kroger and I I shop there a lot now, and uh, I noticed that in the self checkout lane. Um, if you put in your card to pay for your groceries, it won't do anything until you hit the card button on the screen. And I'm like, dude, you know the card's in there. It says right on the little reader that the card is registered, so you should be able to know that, oh, he's paying with a card. But like, it's like, oh, what do I do? Hit, you didn't hit the card button or the cash button, so what do I do? You know, <laughs> It's like, I, I, I think about, okay, yes, this stuff does affect us in a lot of ways. And I think um, this is this is still a very timely and needed topic because uh rachel ross is in the chat and said uh yeah do you want to read her comment uh the second one in there sure um so yeah uh rachel shares uh, i just had to i just flew she flew somewhere to attend a training session on user-centered design and it's it was presented as if it were something new and uh and i think that can be a combination of things because this is going, I think, in a very important organic place. And I, so I don't care about the notes. But there's, there's um, so you think about like, what does it take to put some capability into the world? You probably need to have some sort of funding. You're going to have some sort of organization or uh, financial capacity to 
uh, bring people's time and attention to, to, to do something. And the time and attention, the people who you're probably paying to bring their time and attention about are likely in a, um, in, in the world of software, they're going to be an engineering capability of some kind. Um, one of the broad landscape of engineers, including the, um, those, I'm, I'm not even going to say the phrase. There's a very popular phrase that I, I, I'm not even going to say it. Let's say folks are very multidisciplined and can solve problems at various places in the whole software ecosystem. And if how small, how well-funded you are, how lucky you are to know someone, whatever, that's oftentimes the core requirement, right? Because if you get someone with the funding and design who can't, can't really build the thing, well, okay, you're making expensive presentations probably. Maybe you're able to get... Uh, a great story and pitch and maybe some research together. That's pretty awesome, actually. But you're probably not building it yet. So a lot of things happen with that, just the combination of business and engineering. And they go for it, right? And so to some groups, the idea of bringing in uh, design is is new. Like legitimately, like exp uh, um, the how they see the world and how they frame problems doesn't include design as a concern. And uh, it's like this ghostly phenomena that emerges from people being happy or frustrated from whatever they make. And they're like, hmm, you know, <laughs> how's that going on? And, and it becomes, and, and so in this, in the one aspect of the bad old days was uh, the, that was described as non-functional requirements. When you see um, some, when someone expresses a need to make something uh, work more elegantly or in a different flow or something, it's, it was observed as that's not for the system. So it's not functional. Oh, sorry. Systems aren't functional if they aren't serving humans. So we have to connect those things. So in a way, combine this idea of a lot of things being built without necessarily including design yet, but yet existing in a world where so many things that do include design meet different levels of success and um, adoration and all that design gets included eventually now because we've hit enough critical mass and uh, but yet it's still a uh, it makes sense to me that it's it's new to a lot of folks because they're solving problems based on what they're familiar with and and, and ready to do so they just haven't included design yet once they do they probably won't stop. Speaking of organic, this is a good place to set to segue into your journey in discovering and, and and navigating your relationship with this whole principle of user experience design and human centered design. Um, because like if it makes sense that it's new to somebody, well, I want I want to know about when it was new to you and you know mm -hmm. navigate your growing relationship with this thing. So we're let's now we can go back to the notes because I think this is a good place to go. So what was, what was your Eureka moment? Um, okay. So I was doing things. So think about like when you first started making comics, you were probably doing lots of things that had incidental effects that some of them were in, uh, in a, they, some of them were probably helping your goals and some of them were probably hindering your goals about making stories that connect and, and affect people and were clear and understandable and people wanted more, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing that with making web stuff in the, in the first, let's say, year of my uh, corporate career. Uh, because before that, I had, I'd been, you know, I started a, as a side project, I started a business to make video games with some friends. And then we started to um, do a variety of things because of what we were learning there that included doing little consulting gigs for, for other folks. And it just was kind of a, it was an obvious signal signal of, of like getting paid to do something where in it, in an industry where all of us wanted to go in some way, shape or form. So we gravitated toward that and fast forward to a couple of years uh, into that, where I was in an organization as a web, uh, what was my title? A web architect. And uh, I, let's see, I was doing a variety, wearing lots of hats, I was doing design, but not necessarily as intentionally as, as I could. So I would listen to people. I would think of how I could make things better. I would look at patterns. I would study, at, I mean, colleges that would publish papers uh, at the time, like, what was it? Um, I used to remember the gentleman's name, but it was, uh, 
uh, well, the object oriented hypermedia design methodology, OO HDM. <laughs> and so I literally, I, on a business trip, I brought, I printed this whole thing out because as, as was fashion at the time, um, because I was an airplane 10 years before Kindle existed or whatever. And, uh, I'm, I'm reading this, this whole, this whole methodology, which anyway, it, all sorts of stuff that, um, so as, as voracious as I was studying this stuff, I still was, was missing certain points. And then I had this eureka moment of, uh, being in a training, super funny that, that, um, <laughs> this came up in conversation, uh, that it was saying, okay, he, uh, human factors are something that we all need to become aware of in this company who are, we're making software for people inside and outside the company. And, uh, so this was interesting and I knew that it would be useful. I felt good that it, I would, this was on my calendar. I was going to attend it, but then I came away from it with some really interesting tools, things like, uh, well, human factors, like how people interface with a computer system really matters. Like how we, you know, our abilities, right? So thinking of abilities in the first place, thinking of uh, how we see, feel, and experience the world, um, our cognitive abilities, cognitive load. Are we putting enough on a screen, not, not enough on a screen? And all that depends on who you're serving. And, I, and, and being empowered by that, it helped make sense of interviews where uh, I was working in a financial company. And, and so on the, the, there was a trading floor and uh, the folks at, uh, in that department, their UIs were crammed with data and for information so much. I was like, this can't be working. I don't understand this. Everything I learned said, you know, they gave us the heuristic of seven things plus or minus two, you know, which is a little, uh, has a mixed bag history, but, um, but it isn't, but isn't that harmful of a heuristic to have in mind, but any, but you discover in the context of these people solving the problems they care about for the audience they are serving, which isn't you, <laughs> and you're there to help uh, get them what they need. So you, you're, anyway, things like cognitive load for them was, uh, they wanted a heavy load and it was important for them and they made a lot of money because of that. And things like, well, go ahead. Oh, I just immediately thinking of, um, I don't know if you remember this comic or not, but Spidey Super Stories from the Electric no, Company. I don't. Oh, wait, so yeah. You, you remember the Electric Company and Spider-Man was like, a, they mm -hmm. had like a segment on there where he learned a little yeah. bit about reading through a Spider-Man adventure. Uh, but they made a series of comics. Marvel produced a series of comics based on those shorts called Spidey Super Stories. And I, I got it right up on the screen. First big issue, easy to read and like in, they even put in some issues in the upper corner like easy reader do you remember that character actually no there I he do. is in the bottom right he's in the bottom right of the of the page uh is like it's like uh verified by easy reader that this book is easy to read um but it's like i think about like okay like i'm 19 I'm starting out in comics and it's like watchmen was like the big deal everybody talked about watchmen it's the greatest comic ever written blah 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 and I look at it and it's so visually and narratively dense and it's so challenging to read it. Uh, it, it it's meant to be. It's meant to be a difficult read, right? Like 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 Joyce or something like that. Um, and then you go read Spidey Super Stories. It's like, oh my gosh, there's like one sentence per word balloon, you know? And like they're even using um, verse to help guide us along, you know? No, I can't tell a lie. I'm not a bad guy. I'm glad. My name's Dr. Doom, you know? Uh, so, <laughs> but... That was a moment where I was realizing as a younger person that, oh, wait, depending on who you're talking to, it matters how you construct these pages. It matters how much information, how visually dense, depend like that, that complexity matters. And it's not a one size fits all, you know, uh, ratio. It's and learning, but, and that's a thing you can discover about your audience that what is like what helps them um, experience and perform better because they are not you <laughs> and right. use what matters to them and affects their experience to shape what you make. And it was, this was awesome. And so some other things that, that helped help me a lot um, thinking about the, the sort of conventions of platforms and how many successful apps at the time were creating a language that was more successful than other apps. And so why not, 
build off of the strong, it's like finding uh, comics that communicate well for a particular audience and saying, I should work based on more of that style uh, than something else, right? Especially my own whimsy uh, that's not tested. So things like, and so learning about the platforms and that's not user centric necessarily, but it's thinking of common expected language. So it's not entire, it's not just system centric either. Um, things like information architecture and like just stru structuring the flow of an experience to help people understand where they're at and where they can go next. And keeping that as criteria to say like, is this, this screen working? Because it's so sort of, it's, it is, is it okay that it, that the things stop here and there's nowhere else to go or what else do we, do we need to do? And then, then, then bringing that up because a lot of times working with, uh, working with others where you, these concerns would be new, uh, it's easy to dismiss because it's more work potentially, or it's perceived as more work or perceived as, um, uh, just a, a lesser concern when it's, when it's new to people who hadn't, haven't been considering this. Um, right. So, and also studying things like, well, the task analysis and the flow and all that stuff, you know, is, is how you can, um, and, and, and interviewing your users and using usability testing and all this stuff. Like it was quite a, um, I, sometimes when I tell that story in a brief form, I jokingly call that my spider bite um, because that training I tend to like trainings. I tend to like challenges. There was a lot of interesting challenges there. I was learning new and exciting things. And literally everything they set in front of me, even though it might have been a pretty abstract concept, I was like, boom, weapon, weapon, weapon. I was just loading up to go, like, I'm going to go solve problems now. I can't wait. I was so excited. Um, and uh, and I, yeah, so it's, that was, I, I feel really, really lucky for that, to just have that. The, the, you know, I was paid for dedicated time to study these things. And then I was set in, I was set free in an environment where it's like, go help. <laughs> I was like, sweet, let's, <laughs> let's make some great things happen. And, um, the, let's see. Yeah. And, and have, feel free to stop me or, or whatnot mm. at any point along the way. Cause, uh, cause at that point now more empowered with this also, you know, voraciously reading the other, other things available that people were sharing, especially in academic circles at the time, uh, and thinking about how, how systems can be structured, and, and the parts that face users and the parts that face the system and all that kind of stuff. Um, there was this, I was preparing and encountered a need, and the need was, well, now that everyone was sharing these tools and then using them, uh, like the tools of putting all these cap um, business capabilities on the web and kind of using what we taught, we were taught in that class. I'm not saying that I was the only good student or whatever. I just, I'm just saying like it made sense to me and I felt a bolt of lightning differently than other folks at that class. A couple others felt a similar bolt of lightning, lightning and you could tell as far as at a lunch break or whatever, because we were all energized and everyone else was a little bit like, Whew, hope we end early today, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is fine because it didn't click for them enough yet. They didn't, because they weren't solving problems necessarily defined in that way, but they were experiencing them. Things like, um, so creating systems that, I, I mean, they looked chaotic and weird. There was, um, uh, uh, in, they were inconsistent and full of, of um, just presenting a task in a way where it was hard to solve or confusing, difficult to read and all that. And so there was a lot of um, this need to still make stuff quickly, but then not have it be so chaotic, right? Both for the brand and the story of the business and for just the experience of, of, of getting tasks done in all these different, 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 you know, customer bases, some of them overlapping. And then they would, it, they would open up one app from one team and open up another app from another team. And they look totally different. Like they came from a totally different company on and on. And so the yeah. need was like fit to burst. Right. And I was, and I shared some, I shared some ideas and I was lucky and I got some funding for projects that helped create essentially a, um, a framework to help with both applications and publishing websites in a way. Think of this as like, a, um, well, people were making uh, content management systems at the time. So it was a little bit of a, uh, 
uh, a little bit of a, d- a design pattern framework plus a bit like plus it just was able to be um you can get up and running super fast right at the same time though what i'm hearing and what you're saying is there's also this this tension of freeway construction it still has to function while you're improving it right Mm. uh and, and like the business still has to operate while you're examining how to like create better better systems and and manage the chaos of this thing. So I'm wondering like if you could talk a little bit before we go to break about uh, how UX is also about like navigating the individual cultures that you are operating within and you know in healthy ways trying to find healthy ways to continue to keep them going while improving them uh, and, and managing their chaos. It's yeah, it is interesting because I, that's a really great summary and very super astute where you are doing work on stuff that has to continue to function while the work is happening. And it has to function for a variety of constituencies where it, it has to work for, uh, the teams who are building things It clearly absolutely has to work for the audience where all the, I mean, that's where the business is you know, they, they make the business exist. Um, and so, and so let's see a lot of, uh, I'm thinking of, uh, gosh, what you can affect. This is, this is something that took me longer. So this is not the spider bite. This is now becoming like an older spider. (laughs) Okay. Um, this is Peter B. Parker. (laughs) Sure. It's Peter B. Parker. Uh, and the, it's, it's learning about how, how spreadable is this and what kind of problems can you solve? What, where are you set up? And then it's important to negotiate the space in order to solve the problems if it's possible. Um, it's like discovering, uh, what, what can you change and, uh, which, which, which challenges do you want to, to take on in that? Because maybe there's things you can change easily and some things that'll be difficult, but the, and which ones are worth solving and all that. So like getting in a situation where um, things need to evolve, but there isn't a huge appreciation for um, the inclusion of UX in the pattern of creating a system. Um finding like you need you talking with the people that that influence that space is really important and finding there's going to be somewhere and i guarantee you this that there is common ground that they have with their audience that they're they know they will need to adapt and they'll be able to 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 adapt and for instance things like being accessible right so you can sometimes it's a matter of a um a I call this a poli- like legal constraints. I kind of throw it in a bucket of policy, right? So you can have industries that, that have policies because of their patterns that, that show quality. You could have uh, like opt-in certification thing, whatever. So there's things, that, but then there's, of course, governments, right? Tell you things to do or not do sometimes with, uh, and with, with businesses, which includes accessibility, which is huge. Uh, um, that's another cultural giant foothold that uh, that UX and um, all human centered design can um, well stand on is the legal precedence. So somewhere in there, you will gain um, enough agreement to probably move ahead to help you know to help out on projects. And if you're really having those kind of conversations, I mean, you're you're kind of a you're a new settler in a way. In, in this space. And uh, hopefully you have personality attributes that allow you to feel comfortable with that. Um, because you're not there joining a team that has established patterns and, and has sort of sign off ability to say, nope, this can't be published because par- these problems and therefore let's, re- let's remediate, fix, what have you. And then once that's fixed, then we can sign off on it, on it and then put this in the market or what have you. If you have that kind of um, foothold you're not dealing with the problems like I just described. You're dealing with different problems. You're, you're, you're making things even better somehow because there's always ways to improve for your users. And there's, um, let's see. So I'm curious in this space, uh, Jersey, like where, which, 
I'm, I want to know. I want you to filter me here. Like, where where okay. should I go next okay. to either? So, okay, there's there's two things that I'm thought, hearing. What you're wrap saying. up yeah. or pick a different thing. <laughs> There's two things in what you're saying that I'm, I, I would like to respond to. One is something that Rachel put in the chat that I think speaks to this a little bit is that I think there's some, I'm going to come at it from the angle of one of my biases, which is being a fairly mission driven person. I engage with projects in a way of like, who am I making this for? And thinking about them as being the, um, uh, their pleasure, their experience, their growth is my end goal, whether I'm teaching whether I'm uh, helping to design uh, festivals or making comic books, right? Um, and uh, Rachel adds, yeah, I get frustrated because sometimes we don't get to see how the end user actually uses the thing, and that is the meat of the whole thing, right? So in the case of like comics festivals or classes that I teach, yeah, I get to see that. I have that sense of each, although I don't get the whole picture because I just got a message from a, a student that I hadn't seen in like two or three years who's now in college. And they were like telling me how much my comics class, what, like what an impact it had on them. And now that they're in art school and they were like just looking back and thanking me. And I'm like, wow, you know, it's like at the time I had no idea that this was that meaningful. I knew it was pleasurable for you, but I didn't know it was that profound and meaningful for you in the sense that it, it, it changed your directory or trajectory or or added um some inertia to it um however you want to put it right but i did get to see some but in the case of my comic books it is a treasure when i actually get to see at a, at a comic show like at a, at a comic con and watch a kid actually read the book and see how they read the book right uh, and maybe even talk with them about reading the book that is that is so rare i don't actually get to see like science comics rockets i've had maybe three conversations with children about the book right so i have no idea if what if my assumptions and um the design elements that ann and i introduced into the book were effective you know um the second thing that I hear in there, what was the second thing that I heard in there? Uh, I think I got lost in my first thing that I heard. <laughs> well, the first thing you said is super powerful and, and an awesome insight as well, because uh, one of the great things you can do if you're willing to start to include the humans, and this is why it doesn't go away once you start, because it helps you really understand if you're solving problems. If you are engineering to solve problems, if you are building a business to bring more value and 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 uh, and increase your success with your audience, you need to understand that feedback loop of well, what is what is the experience of your audience when they engage with your thing, your product, or your service, um, or your book, or whatnot. It's it's there are ways to do that that help you learn a lot, and there's there's ways that are kind of they're they're more theatric and not. You, you, there's not a lot of great data that comes out of it, but things that just are actually really simple and powerful is just being able to observe. And yeah. I think we'll, we'll yeah. talk about some of the stuff in the, in the next half too, <laughs> but, um, being able to observe. And I think there's a variety of things that, um, uh, uh one of the, uh, a person that's highly quotable in the UX community because he's been around a long time. He's super skilled and he's done a ton of teaching and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Jared Spool. Um, he, he, he calls a metric, uh, what customer exposure hours. And so if you have, if that's zero, um, you're in a, you have a problem. Um, and then something way above that is probably useful to be able to, to, um, and, and especially if you have a little bit of exposure plus mediation and, and, uh, like someone having thoughtful time to get data out of that and uh, have conversations that are meaningful and useful to the, to the team. So if you have a UX researcher that's helping facilitate customer exposure hours, uh, your team is going to be better prepared and connected to where it's like there's a meaningful conversation when, you, when, when a, a system is a type of communication. You're writing a letter in a way. You're, you're creating a book. You are creating a statue or a, um, a staircase or a... Um, an elevator or whatever, it's a, a system communicates and it doesn't communicate unless it reaches the people, right? And if you're there to see the connection ex uh, happen and, and, and discover the nuance of that experience, not just say communication happened, success, right? Wait a minute. There's probably more to it than that. Um, and, and another thing that we can cover uh, later on in, in the second half too, but um, Anyway, that's that's very powerful. It's it's and and that in and of itself, seeing real people 
affected by what you make or contributed to making, whether you're on the, you know, quality assurance team or the, um, the marketing team or whatever thing, like all the stuff and the ideas get put into apps and creations. Uh, every one of you needs to have some understanding about when that creation meets its audience, what happens then? Yeah. It's powerful because we, we have empathy for people. We, we watch stories, we experience and learn and deal with stories. And that completes the story of your communication through your system. That's good. Uh, the, the other little button I'll put, I'd like to try to put on the end of that before we go into break is that I remember my second point was as you were talking about being a settler in a new land when you're trying to like help an organization manage the chaos while still doing what they're supposed to do and introduce more design into their thinking. I'm reminded of I just rewatched uh, Seven Samurai, the Kurosawa film. Have you ever seen this? Hmm. I have. It's been a while. Back when um, I had a laser disc. Oh, wow. Whoa. That's a long time wow. ago. And whew, fancy RCA mm -hmm. video disc by any chance? The one you had to flip? It was no? it was flipper. It's uh, <laughs> pi pioneer. Ah, um, but Tashiro Mifun's character in there is like he's one of the seven samurai who's like helping this this group of villagers. But we find out that he is not a samurai. He is a former farmer, and so he's sort of like between both worlds, where he's like he's he's criticizing the samurai for being a bunch of like you know um, uppity snobs. And a bunch of uh, elitists, and then he's criticizing the farmers for not being respectful about these people who are there to help them, you know. And so he's like speaking truth to both sides, and like he he comes across as kind of like a, a jerk and kind of an abrasive character and a little bit of a slob. But like it's he, what makes his character so memorable is that he's the guy who's in the middle of this, like he's watching the tensions happen, and he's calling it out, right? Which isn't the easiest place to to, to stand. Yeah, it's. <laughs> It's uh, that's it's a connecting discipline. User, user experience is inherently trying to make sense of the making sense of the system, and make uh, and and power up everyone with with uh, making more informed choices that that help show the effects, both the intentionality and then the outcomes of connecting with the users. So that's pretty exciting if <laughs> if you like that kind of thing, but. I'll, also, I guess, or you're just, you might be frustrating a lot of people. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I wanted to point, I wanted to point to that because I think that like, that's a story we can watch to say like, okay, here's somebody heroically navigating that and maybe ruffling a few feathers, but Hey, he's, he's really easy on the eyes. He's fun to watch. So maybe you could be too. Uh, all right. How about we take a break? All right. I think that's <laughs> great. Okay. We'll come back in about a minute and a half to talk about uh, some ways that Rob thinks about this, and I will respond to them as I have been. Um, but before we do that, we got to thank some people who make this show possible. The folks are people who support us on Patreon. Yes, patreon.com slash lean into art is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you say, hey, I've been listening to this show for a long time. I believe in Rob and Jersey and what they do. How do I make it more sustainable? Well, you go to patreon.com slash lean into art and you can contribute as little as a dollar a month. And the more people do that, the more sustainable the show becomes. You could always donate more if you really want to. And it's, you could do a one-time donation. You can cancel at any time. You're not subscribing with something that's gonna be difficult to unsubscribe from. So let me thank five people Up on that. who have- So, we, yeah. so we're set up as a Patreon that does the collection at the end of the month. Yeah. So please wait till after that. <laughs> there you go. So I want to thank Jodels Pox. Thank you, Jodels. You can find him at JBombArtist on Twitter. Stephen Black. Thank you, Stephen. You can find Stephen on Twitter at Black Sideshow. Two S's in the middle. <coughs> Part Pardon me. <laughs> good to be curious. Thank you. Good to be curious. You can find them on Twitter at Good to be curious. Greg Horvath. You can find Greg on Twitter at IGM Horv 77. And finally, JS Taskus. Thank you, JS. You can find JS on Twitter at JS Taskus. You can join them at patreon.com slash lean into art. <coughs> Pardon me, where you'll find all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who uh, support us on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe place with fellow leaners. Patreon.com slash lean into art. Thank you for your support. It means a lot to us. Are you okay, Jersey? <laughs> Are we going to start a Save Jersey campaign? <laughs> you know, wrong pipe. I, I took a pipe, sip. Yep. To like just timings, everything. Just wet the whistle, and all of a sudden I'm. Go <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. Okay. Uh, just getting those round tones. Round. To all right, here we go. Uh, music for the second half of the show, 
And I know we're going to get excited about this one. So why not dip into the exciting bag? Oh, yeah. Asking why is, is an exciting, uh, it's an exciting prompt. Oh, it, yeah. <sighs> Interesting thing about um, the space of UX and where you're at. And I think we'll have some thoughts on this later. Is is just the, <clears throat> how can you, how, how are, how are questions appreciated or not? <laughs> uh, because mm-hmm. if you're going to get on this path, there's going to be a lot of questions. So. It's a it's an interesting, interesting signal about the compatibility of of um, including uh, user centered concerns with where you're at. So, um, brief tour of UX, in a way. Um, this is very applicable to your to your projects, your personal projects, your side projects, your small business, or if this is uh, your main thing. You are a small business person. Um, I imagine with you know subscribing to this podcast, you're, you're into, um, some kind of storytelling and whatnot. That's awesome. Uh, this is, uh, we've, we visited UX as a topic here a bunch of times and, and because it's full of tools that are handy to say, I want to make a better choice on the thing I'm about to do next. So let me do some research. Let me do some primary research where I'm going to ask people to just see how this thing I currently made is working or behaving. Right, so uh, maybe that's a bit of usability, uh, and even with a comic, you can do that with with uh, like legibility and um, what are people comprehending from it and whatnot. And so, with that, you want to put the thing in front of people and not ask leading leading questions. Just give enough context and see how see what happens, and then you're kind of observing the performance of not them but the thing you made. It's really powerful <clears throat> uh, and. What's that? Oh, no, I'm clearing my throat. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. Yeah, that's, that is no fun. Uh, wrong pipe. for the. It's like you're betrayed by your coffee. Um, so, uh, so UX tools, like, you get, like research or collaboration. Um, you know, if you're on a team, you're, you're, you're one of your constitu- constituencies becomes, uh, well, not just your business goals, not just your audience, but also who are you, who are you working with? And uh, including your team is, it, it's immensely powerful because it gets you outside of your head. It gets you more ideas, gets you, yeah. And you're just a, in a better way, better, more, you, you have the potential to like sort of facilitate more robust decision-making. Um, all this, we've talked about minimum viable product. We've talked about all sorts of things. So like creating a, t- a thing that you can put in the world and then get evidence that you can observe. Super powerful. Just like, you know, if you had a thing already in the world and getting new observations on it, whatever it's, if this was a concept and you thought, well, what's the most important portion of this concept? That's the minimum viable product. Um, I don't know. I, I still love the concept of that, but then so many words get, um, jargonized yeah they don't taste as good after being jargonized um <laughs> and so, there's also there's also getting a sense of um like so in again i'm gonna bring in a comics principle is like when you're writing dialogue for your characters you, you try not to write just pure exposition expositional dialogue because people don't talk like that you know, usually the way we talk reveals something about us and our worldview. And so listening and and really um, uh, really being curious about the people on your team and being curious about their feedback and listening hard to it. Um, I mean, this is what happened when we did the, the crossover episode with Alex uh, Simmons and Chris Ryan of the Tell the Damn Story podcast is that Chris Ryan said, like, Rob is a champion listener. You can tell he's listening really hard when you're talking, right? And, and, and why? Because um, we reveal things about ourselves and what our motivations are through the way we discuss a thing. So it's not just about like having an open and honest conversation about like, well, let's see how to make this thing the best we can. Also discovering what everybody even wants out of it. Um, so you can have harmonious and, and like clear understandings with one another on the team, um, hopefully. It, right, exactly. Hopefully. Because you may find you don't actually share a common purpose. <clears throat> and right then that's an important conversation to have. So 
um, as far as maybe going separate ways with different uh, participants and all that. It's it's just you know part of part of making things. Uh, yeah. So just <clears throat> in your project in your business, uh, listening to your audience, observing your audience with you know what are they what are they saying and doing, and is what you're hoping comes comes about comes about. And I mean that we've covered that a lot. I'm sure we'll cover more again because it's really, uh, it's fun and useful, but um, yeah, collaborations and consulting, let's say you're, you're um, you know, you, maybe you fund your creative projects through making things for other people. Okay. Well, the tools of UX are going to help you in uh, with, well, the, like Jersey described, listening to your collaborators um, and observing how things work with them and the collaborators, as far as like stakeholders and uh, even in your audience, like there's this whole idea of, um, I hesitate every time, every time I'm about to say more jargon, um, this idea of co-creation, huge love for the concept, huge love for the practice, right? Because mm -hmm. it's how you can, uh, inclusively make stuff. You may look at yourself as a creator, as this solo, uh, you know, vision inspired entity that weaves your will into a thing and you cast it into the world but you don't exist in a vacuum and that's not exactly how it works standing on the shoulders of all sorts of others and there's not no right. idea under the sun and but there is your creative voice and blah 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 right yeah it's it's a funny tension to, to to navigate because yes we are all individual and very special that is very true that is undeniably true um but you're right we also exist in a society there's that always that tension between like i'm an individual and you're a society and we have to work together somehow something ann and i do when we sign copies of rockets for kids is we sketch uh the character todd the bear in the in the front page and we use it as a teaching me uh, mechanism every time we do it so like we, we say to them okay we're gonna sign the book but we're also gonna show you how we made it and so we open it up and then I pencil the the bear and I'm talking through this idea of like, well, I'm sketching. I'm just throwing out a bunch of lines because I don't know which one's the right line yet. I'm trying to find it by throwing down lots and lots of lines. It's sort of like barfing out all the wrong lines to find the right line. And then I hand it to Anne and she starts thinking. She says, now I'm going to look in here and I'm going to see where the right lines are. Maybe Jersey didn't even find the right line. Maybe I have to find it. But he gave me a good place to start. And so she's inking while she's talking it through. And then um, we explained to the kids like, now... I could have inked that myself if I really wanted to, but it wouldn't look the same. But together, we've created something that neither of us could have created alone. And that's the fun of doing this kind of collaboration together, right? Um, and, and, and maybe it's better, maybe it's not better. It doesn't matter. The whole point is to create something that neither of us could do on our own. Um, so like, that's what I think about when I think of like, collaboration is um, that spirit, that, that thinking in co-creation. Um, it's, that's, that's really cool. What a, what a neat way to, to, to demonstrate that because, uh, you're also co-creating because of the experience and how you're presenting it and, and how you're in a way performing the act with the person at your table, right? The very yeah. act of it happening wouldn't happen without them. And so yeah. it's acknowledging that part of the creativity is the audience and then how you involve them, like through customer exposure hours or basic observations or learning about the performance of what sells and not sells and all, all these data signals that you can bring in, uh, acknowledging co-creation and trying to find ways to uh, make it work well for your project is, um, um, let's see, it's very useful. And uh, let's see, it's useful because, yeah, like you said, you're, you're creating something that uh, may not have, it's, it's, it's somehow, it's, it's a, it's an embodiment of your shared purpose. And the other aspect of this is time. So that happened once, and then you probably did it again. And maybe mm -hmm. it wasn't for the same person, right? Mm -hmm. But I wonder, so does that, mm -hmm. did that evolve a bit over time? Like how you, how you do that exercise? Um, in the sense that the language evolved, right? So like, uh, as, uh, and de depending on the audience and how well they seem to be, so we're looking at the kid while we're working too. And if, if I see the kids like not really understanding or can't see quite what I'm doing, I'll stop 
and I'll hold it up and I'll say like, can you see that? And this is starting to look like a bear. And if they're like, no, nah, I'm like, okay, well then I clearly need to add more lines. And so I add more lines and like, now is it looking like a bear? Okay, maybe. Um, but so like in that sense, the perform the performance is a little bit different every time based on the interactions we get with the audience. But the, the principle of the thing has remained pretty consistent uh, after the first couple of times. That makes sense. So you, you, you know, you tested your idea and, and you found that, um, so in a way you're not creating necessarily a new, new product every, every time because there, there's nuances, but little, little aspects, but the perform, you built this capacity of reliable performance because it's, it's adjustable, right? Because you're including this current audience and whatnot. And that does actually apply to systems where if you are building a piece of software, an app or making a video, writing a book, what a, maybe even writing a book and you have sort of like your, your, your test audience or some, a brain trust or something like that. Um, and because you're not creating a system as an announcement or a pro proclamation, you're creating it as a conversation. And that conversation, because you're there and adapting, it makes it adjustable and lets you do those other things that jargony, failing small, um, all that. And make uh, adapt and adjust based on what you're learning and the signals you're getting based on the intent that you have and your understanding of your audience. And you're meant to be affected by understanding your audience. If you just walked in assuming stuff about people and supposedly included them and then feel like, well, we knew what we needed to know and all that, that's a sign you're not doing it right somewhere. In there oh, the, the example I would use for that is every time I teach a class of teenagers because <laughs> I know now that it's going to take until the third week before any of them feel comfortable enough to interact with me. Before that moment, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the enemy, but they, they are so afraid of revealing anything about themselves. They're all sitting with their arms crossed and they're hunched up. They, like, they don't even want to physically be in contact with one another. They're so protective of themselves, right? Mm. And when I first encountered that, without the context and without... I, you know, shame on me. I didn't go back and really think about what was it like when I was a teenager? How did I feel when, I, when like a new teacher came into the room? So I made the assumption, oh my gosh, they hated me. I, I did a really poor performance, you know? And then it took a couple more subsequent in, uh, encounters with it where I realized, oh, because like now there's these three kids who are sticking around after class and they really want to talk to me one on one, you know? So uh, now I have a more informed set of assumptions, but still, when I walk into a room, I know that it's going to take a certain amount of time before I really understand what the dynamics are in this room. Yeah, because it's a different group of kids, a different context. I just did the Buckeye Book Fair and I had I walked into a room of 60 seventh graders, you know, and they're like, do a thing. I'm like, okay, happy to try, you know. And uh, I it was about it took me about 10 minutes to to figure out, like walking around the room and engaging with the kids to figure out what the energy was and how I could play with it. And then when I saw it, there was this one kid who was really giving me like the stink eye and leaning back and like he was kind of like scoffing a little bit. I'm like, OK, I clearly need to make fun of you a little bit in a playful, loving way and get you involved in this. I'm, so, I'm like, so I, I do this little bit in my uh, spiel where I talk about how lines are like visual poetry. And so I, I go like, hey, what's your name? He's like, Brad. And I'm like, okay, so if I say to Brad, oh, Brad, you are a rose. Oh, Brad, you are a swan. And if Brad says, make up your mind, did he get the point? You know, and the kids all laugh and Brad's like this. But then afterwards, he comes up to me. He's like, okay, that was the coolest thing. That was the coolest uh, presentation we saw today. Thanks a lot for that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but but it took years of working with teens to know how to, how to navigate that, right? And it, my first time out, I would have read this and like the huffing and scoffing at what I was saying is like, he hates me. And I'm I'm not good at this, right? Instead of realizing that this is a transaction and this is there's like uh, there's give and take with this. Oh gosh, you're hitting so many awesome points. Um, because one thing that you're doing in uh, to to some extent, a UX designer can be focused on the um, can execute a credible design that seems to solve a given problem with this context. So if you're starting out in UX, you probably get, well, tasks like that. So thinking about, um, well, hey, we need some of these screen, screens designed. We need a, um, you know, we need to do some kind of new process for how we onboard people. And this is what we're currently doing. And then uh, go compare that with what 
10 other products in our industry are doing and come up with recommendations. So you may have to do a little research project or whatnot, but you're, and whether, but within a narrow space, right? So you're, but but no matter what you're doing, some kind of facilitation of learning because you're going out, you're gathering some kind of evidence and then you're finding a way to share it. And the reason you're doing that, it isn't, it isn't like the act in and of itself has its uh, standalone value, which is, why sometimes businesses don't start with design right away that because it's not as obvious um, because it it is inherently there to enhance the uh, like what people choose to build and make as far as products and the way they make them and all that. So as you're um, let's see, as you're uh, you may wear very specific hats or more general hats. And that may be because of you have, found, let's see, you found way to serve in a, um, like a lead role in a large institution. That's when you might become more of a generalist or you're starting out fresh and you're out there in the less, less settled lands. And, and, uh, you're out there working with someone who is an organ. I mentioned business, but I interchange that with any organization. So that could be a government entity, a educational institution, but it is an organization that is um, you know, something comprised of, you know, a bunch of people to uh, bring about some value to uh, a market or a society. It's an organization. Um, and where was I going with that? So the, you, could, you could wear a few hats or many hats, but in any case, you're there to, to facilitate some kind of learning. And um, the, you can be in spaces and notice that that you have the uh, you're so you could be the facilitator as well as what would what, what, with you, the example you described where if you notice there's a need probably for the connection there's probably um, you're there to adapt and figure out well how do you how do you fire up the learning from all of the different participants going on and they may need you to uh, reach out to them in different ways which yeah. could be summarizing your research presenting it interviewing yeah. them. Yeah, it doesn't have to happen as quickly as the as scenario I was describing, but it's like, yeah, the, 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 what I was trying to connect with is this idea that different groups of people have different needs and approaches um, and watching how they interact with it is valuable data to help, you know, craft the thing to make it more useful to them specifically. Um, because I've, I've, I've also, you know, talked with certain teaching cartoonists um, unfortunately, who have said things like, oh, they didn't, clearly didn't appreciate what I brought into that room. I'm like, well, maybe, <laughs> but you know, it's like, it's a two way street. Like, what, what did you, how did you present it? How did you craft it? Did you, did you react to the room at all? Like what, what was happening? I wasn't there for the dynamics. So I couldn't tell what was happening, but, but you know, there's also, That's you can. so hard that there's layers to it because what you see on the surface may not tell the, well, almost guarantee doesn't tell the whole story. Right. which is why you have to work in more signals and try to find other ways to research and learn. And so yeah. um, through interviewing, through um, having people actually interact with things, the more you can get observational evidence and find ways to um, describe, is that, does that mean you're building something that's fit or unfit for the task and the goals and all that stuff? Um, and then along the way, helping, uh, like, like I said, facilitating learning, um, in a way, the way you're doing that through describing what's um, the choices of the system so far in an inclusive way, and and then the aspects that you are you're designing represent the voice of all that stuff you're including, and you're also providing the story of it that that helps show how um, it's uh, it 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 helps others understand your choices in. In, in what you made so they can participate still like the story doesn't end after you told it um it's yeah 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 I, I, i'm reminded of another piece of advice a, a friend a creative friend of mine once said is that no no good sentence starts with the audience will expect <laughs> and like what i'm like I, <laughs> Like what I, because, because it, it, it's, it's a huge assumption baked into that, that, that preface, right? Whereas like, you're talking about like a really active engagement with the people using the thing. Um, so that you're not assuming anything, you're actually getting feedback and then changing it so that, yeah. And then, and then 
it, this is experience, user experience. This is something that people are going to engage with. I, I would say that comics has a UX, right? Depending on, um, yeah. hundred percent they do. Whether it's a, one of those giant Different, French comics. And not just comics one or, UX. I mean, there's UX per comic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so, well, let's see. So we try to uh, wrap up this section with one more swing at what is UX because we kind of described sure. the roles and applying it and all that stuff. And just to, to I want to have like, so you, you can demystify because in, in a way it's like we're talking about, oh, teaching and groups and all peop these people and these different hats and, and, and it's, you know, maybe you're doing research and you're presenting it and all that stuff. But um, really uh, what what you're doing with, so UX is a, human centered systemic minded design discipline and set of tools to accomplish goals and it's about finding choosing and exploring to help solve problems and needs and wants and that includes the needs and wants of your um well your business your users your team and maybe even yourself and that's something i've been journaling about recently too because you can end up on projects where you're like oh do i want this in my career history um <laughs> <laughs> so worth thinking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then, uh, okay. So then you have, um, you've got a process. This is not a, uh, like, so like we could talk about making story and comics and, and whatnot and how like there's a way to divide up the big problem that you can solve smaller problems to contribute toward confidently progressing. And the, there's, a lot of ways to do this and how they go depends on everyone involved because they it's like every every comic has its own specific ux every project and you know team has their own specific ux so think about there's uh generally this flow of like discover something discover build verify and then complete right so mm -hmm. and you want to know you're done with a project at some point because chances are you're not doing this as a voluntary you know, life position forever. It's probably deals with um, basics of, you know, doing service for, for a fee and in some way, or right. it's your product on your business and you can't afford to fund it infinitely, what have you. So it's got an ending and it's got a beginning and the beginning is a big deal because that's where you're, you're discovering in order to not just describe problems your the problems you list at first are also assumptions maybe super informed by your exper expertise and your team's expertise but mm -hmm. you're trying to pick the pick the problems to solve and then know that they're they're the right thing to do and how do you know they're the right thing to do because it's a research project right it's you're looking for the evidence to provide the thread and the common the combination of evidence plus your goals you're going to find a path between you and your audience and that's going to be clarified. So the discovery is like this general problem solving space. Like we're going to make a product in this space. We're going to make a story or a game or whatever in this space for these people. And you've got that solved enough to say, fund it. Let's proceed. And well, fund it more because that's still work too. So if you're discovering, I hope you're getting paid because there's really hard work in that part of the process, including things like facilitation and weaving in all these different disciplines and potential, you know, constraints and concerns, depending on the organization, et cetera. Um, for instance, like, wait a minute, there's so much, you know, we're, we're going to make a, and I'm making this up, although it's partially not made up, but because I don't know the design process that they went through, but i I saw, a, I saw an article for a company that made a dunk tank that was a flame tank. So you had to get in a flame suit, protective suit, and you get dunked in flames, right? Yeah. So think about those constraints. Anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, That's exciting. <laughs> yeah. A bit risky, probably. Yeah. Um, hopefully that, yeah, the, some, some risks to, uh, to understand and, and whatnot clarify there and test your assumptions. Um, cause it's not, oh, that'll be fine. Um, that wouldn't pan out. Uh, 
So let's see. So yeah, discovery, but then you, you, you build it and then you verify what you build is done. And then you have some kind of complete handoff thing. And there's probably more to it than that because the life cycle of a business isn't just a product. And then you, then the business stops, right? So right. things go on from there, but within the convenience, it's kind of like characters in a story. Yeah. They existed before the story started. Yeah. They exist after the story started maybe, but, uh, or ended. Um, but then, you know, it, this completes that particular story. It makes it a manageable piece of work. Yeah. Um, and then as far as navigating all that stuff, you can learn a lot about, well, how do you fit with this project and whatnot? Um, like what kinds of problems are off limits, which is related to how you ask questions and stuff. Um, and how is this group set up to learn? And are they excited about that? Or reluctant? And how does, how's that going to work with your role and your interests? Because in some ways, you might get a charge out of, of helping everyone uh, experience the power up of getting user centered in what they're making. It's, it, it can be pretty exciting because all of a sudden things that they're, and this is the selfish thing, right? I, I, I hope that everyone was going to feel good about that same kind of spider bite in a way. Now I'm the spider. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, ah. User centered is is that this? selfish? Is that I would I would argue with you on that one because I feel like the selfish approach would be like, well, these people clearly don't understand what I've got. You know, I'm here with all this user centered thinking, and they don't want to listen to me. So, f them. You know, uh, <laughs> you can't help some people. You know, I feel like that would yeah. be the selfish approach. Whereas, like what you're describing, yes, there's a mutual benefit. You get the thrill out of being the spider who bites. But uh, that also requires you have to you have to step up and give a little bit more of yourself to that dynamic. Yeah, because I mean, it's that is an, its own process meeting people with where they're at, and mm -hmm. and you are a a facilitator of learning, and your audience may relate well with that or not. And you, you need to learn why and like digging into the, that kind of complexity can be, uh, can be, can be great because, you know, on, on the other side, you're changed and they're changed. You've learned through that reaching out. Mm -hmm. So, and I've, I've, we've chatted about the goals, the different constituencies, your users, your organization, your team, and you, if having those is so powerful, if you have a list of goals. Why? Like someone's like, hello, I am miss this, uh, the money place of, you know, business value. Please help me solve problem. Here's money. And you're like, great. What's the problem? They're like, it's this. And then you run off and try to do something. You don't have enough of an understanding to solve the problem probably, uh, because you may understand their goals or not because investigating can unearth and discover hidden complexity even with what someone said in one conversation, there may be layers to it. So you get to get, dig through more of the layers of, of, yeah, the organization you're serving and then, and then getting your users goals and then finding ways that is so interesting. The kind of, well, this, the design challenges of finding ways to, to, you know, bridge the goals. And, um, and of course the team you're working with and yourself and yourself just as a big asterisk, hold on, wait a minute. Um, that's dangerous too, because if you're like, well, I would like to build the, I would like to be on the system just because it pumps up my status or whatever. It's like, okay, yeah, think about, you know, enlightened self-interest there, whatever. But mm -hmm. um, worth, uh, worth noting that you're going to have probably a lot of tensions navigating your design choices if you're really trying to include yourself more than your audience along the way. So, so or it might feel like a lot more work than you had intended if you're really not in it for the work itself. <laughs> right? Work feels a lot more <laughs> no like doubt. work when you don't want to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I just take credit at the end as long as it's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a hard ride. Um, yeah. Probably not too into UX. That's, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think that's a fair argument, <laughs> you know, or maybe you're not fully bought in yet. You got more to more to explore and discover. Yeah. Anyway, so you're solving problems and mapping things out because you get this contempt, the contempt, uh, con 
conceptual understanding of something Mm -hmm. that helps mature an idea from abstract squishiness into like, here's clear intention of how things can flow and how they could be structured. And here's why we believe this is credible because of the research and here's who we included and methods and all that kind of stuff. And then we move on. And so you'll be doing more of that stuff when you're doing new things, right? So um, a lot of the last like uh, six years of my career has been more toward innovative spaces and innovative spaces are kind of neat, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a gift and a challenge because uh, there's newness and there's flexibility, even in, a, even in a large institution to say like, I don't know, what do you need? <laughs> Versus, well, we've solved it this way for years and there's no wiggle room. <laughs> so good luck innovating. Um, <laughs> so that, yeah, so this is, it's an interesting thing where if you're generating new ideas, this is a, um, you can spend more time in that discovery and maybe, maybe you're generating lots of potential product ideas and working with a few teams to, to explore and all that stuff. And that's, that's pretty neat. This process helps you. This process helps you with, um, then also just, uh, okay, maybe you don't have the time or budget to evaluate new ideas, but you can look at stuff in the world. You can facilitate a usability study of your competitor's product. So learn from what someone else made. How did that, that doesn't tell you like it can be what it, it can be empty calories. So it's dangerous. It's, it's there's, there can be, you know, watch out how much time you do that kind of thing because it's still not necessarily your goals. And if you, get excited to clone a thing, but really aren't into it. Mm. There's a pretty dangerous path there potentially. But if you're looking for pitfalls that you want to solve in a new, interesting way, eh, you know, could be some good info. (laughs) (laughs) So, all right. Anyway, combine all this stuff. You may be doing research on your own, uh, primary research, secondary research, benefiting from all the, the, the stuff of others. And, um, you're, yeah, uh, I mentioned a whole bunch of different potential hats and skills because as a generalist, you may have to study and practice tons of different things like interviewing is, is a skill, right? Doing a survey of any kind of value whatsoever is a skill. Um, cause surveys are dangerous that they can pre- go through that. You can go through the motions where you feel like you're learning something, but you're not learning necessarily based on the great signals of uh, observational evidence of people really doing something or people telling a story about their past and how they feel about what they did. That's where the better, better data exists. Mm. Having someone predict, Hey, you want to buy like all my books in 10 years or whatever sure, maybe they feel like that today or whatever, but people are, we're not great at predicting our future behavior to that degree that helps with really informing what products you make and stuff. So mm, watch out for that. Um, I guess, all right, final point. Happy okay. to I, I, I have direction. No, you, you wrap it up any way you want because I have mm-hmm. final thought written down right here. I know what I want to ask you about for final thought. All right. So then, so then in UX, it's, it kind of sounds, I know we covered a bunch of things. Um, you can have an impact whether you're helping companies or you build new products and stuff, improve existing products um, that may have lots of new possibility, right? So like a getting or in early on, a, on either uh, like a new product or when someone's like, wow, we've got this line of products and we are evolving it all because it's all kind of outdated for some reason, what have you. I've been involved in those kind of projects that they're, bi- they have, they're neat in various ways because they're high stakes and they're big and stuff like that. A lot of interesting risks and st- stuff to manage and explore and help and all that. But then there's, there's examples of, um, and, and an example for that would be, um, a really neat resource we've mentioned on the show before, but uh, if you're like, I want to know more tangible what this process is like, well, uh, go check out the uh, de- the design kit for human centered design that uh, IDEO shares. Um, they are early proponents of this kind of interdisciplinary method that is human inclusive and systemic minded, and it's really uh, it it should give you a, a nice taste of of what kind of stuff happens here. 
for the wide possibility space projects. Um, but then there's projects where you're like, this could be better. And, but it's just making a screen different, right? And there's this really cool article that by Jared Spool, which I mentioned earlier, called the $300 million button. And it's, it, was, uh, it was a project that wasn't super complex, but had a giant effect on a business because they, I mean, it's in a nutshell, they looked at how a screen was performing for someone who was trying to buy a product on a popular site, right? And it had this, this it there was way too much that you can think of it as friction in the transaction ah jargon sorry all right um there's uh something stopping people from completing this task even though they're bought in they want it what have you but just enough where it was costing the company you could look at it they just weren't earning this money so they started to earn 300 million more dollars per year because of this change and it was essentially changing just the, the, a tiny, simple form. So I would say it's not exactly a button. It makes it a cooler title for the article. But, um, but you can see that like this is, you could, you could feel like, what? I'm a systemic-minded human-centered designer. I can solve great, fantastical issues and let, you know, set me loose on the, on, the, on the world of interesting problems to solve in, in uh, finance, government, retail. Who cares? Let's go. But here you here someone is just facilitating a, a project to learn to fix a screen, you know, still big effect. Yeah, that's great. We'll link to those in the show notes. I, I pulled them up on the screen while you were talking about them, but I'll, I'll link to them in the show notes so people can follow up on these. Um, cool. Uh, do you want to take a break and then do final thought? I do. That sounds awesome. All right. I'm actually kind of proud that I haven't gone as long as I thought I would so far. So I'm, I'm doing a little victory laugh and watch me <laughs> wipe out in the final thought. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to finish the race. I see the finish line. Here I come. <laughs> well, the final thought is I want to talk a little bit about adaptability and what that means and what and, and psychically what that asks of us to be adaptable um, mm -hmm. because we can champion this skill set all we want, but there's a cost to uh, being adaptable that I've run into at least, and I'd like to get your take on it. So um but before we do that, I want to thank some other people who make the show possible. Those people have to be us. We make the show possible. And the thing that I make, and you know, it generates a lot of thinking that I bring to the show, is I make comic books. And one that I hope you will check out is Boulder and Fleet Adventures for Hire. And it is a 90, well, the book is called Mining for Trouble. That's the title. It's a 92-something page graphic novel. Um, it's formatted like the old golden super adventure books from the 80s. Um, but it's... Um, it's two best friends, a bear and a bird, who want to make the world a better place by going out and being uh, freelance adventurers. And uh, there's a little bit of a tension between the two characters in that the bird is very ambitious and thinks that the way to becoming very successful at her business is by stomping the most bad guys. But her partner, who is this very big and powerful bear, he would much rather, because he's, so, he's not so business-minded, he's more thinking holistically and he wants to, uh, you know, wouldn't it be more effective if we made our enemies our friends? And then we're actually like improving the world a little bit instead of like punishing people for trying to make the world uh, less good. And so... Sometimes she's right, sometimes he's right. And in this story, we navigate that as they take on a bunch of stone girls who eat precious metals and they take over a, a mine and start injuring innocent miners and it causes some conflict in the story. Mining for Trouble, you can find it at books.jdrozd.com. Now, Rob, you said at the top of this episode that you do coaching and facilitation. What does that mean? Well, uh, I can help you with exploring and navigating uh, anything from collaborative choices or big creative project choices or even career things. And because I'm a coach and you can uh, check out robcoach.me and sign up for a free discovery session to learn more about how the, you know, the, the effect that coaching can, can have on you. And um, we actually did a live coaching example on the show a couple months or a couple weeks back, maybe a month back. And really it's, it's really all about, um, yep, I've, I bring experience to a situation, but it's, it's not exactly consulting, right? Because so in consulting, you talk with someone about, well, I want to hire out you, you know, this, this problem, right? There's a, I need a UX design for this, uh, you know, to improve the performance of this, uh, uh, well, this button in my, you know, um, 
store, right? Well, interesting. And this is more about, uh, you can't really outsource your own choices toward, for where you want to go next, but you can sort of enlist assistance in thinking things through. And so what that's, that's what I do is I listen really deeply to the kind of challenges and the things that you're, are keeping you up about the projects that you're trying to make happen and bring into the world or where you want to go next. Maybe you're evaluating a couple of different uh, career choices. That's very common. Well, um, I ask various questions that help pull you through that process. And so this could be something that you're doing as a one-time event or, um, and you're really building up to a big decision, or maybe you have a series of, of choices or whatnot. So I've even have coaching packages available as well. So you can sign up for a free discovery session, decide if you like it, and then go, go further from there with one or one or more, um, a one-off session or a package of three. So go to robcoach.me to, to do that. Robcoach.me. It's a sentence. See, Rob coach me. Uh, so uh, the other thing that we hope you will check out if you haven't already is the Lean Into Art Discord. Yes, we have a Discord server, um, and we'll link to it in the show notes, the invite code. And it's it's a forum. Lean Into Art has a forum where you can talk with fellow leaners. There's three public channels. There's topic requests where you can ask us about like you know things you'd like us to cover on the show, comments where you can comment on past episodes, but then also challenges, quests. So if you're doing any of the various challenges over creative challenge season, like Art Sound Off, you can post your results there. And then there's three channels for people who support us on Patreon. There's Castle Level Up, where you can share some work in progress and get some feedback from your brain trust. Gentle Town, where you can, it's okay to ask for a high five. You work hard on this stuff. And finally, a social channel where you can just talk about what's going on in your life, uh, share photos of neat things that you're doing. So the Lean Into Art Discord. And thanks to everybody who has been interacting with us there. It means a lot to us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Final thought. Final thought. Um, I could tell you that when I'm making comics, I start with I mean, I, I've been doing this 20 some odd years now, so I have some experience. I've made some things that are like various various degrees of success, uh, successful in terms of like audience upta uptake on it. Um, so I feel like I have informed assumptions, but I'm still largely operating from assumptions when I'm making a new thing. Uh, I'll, or, or maybe I'll have like some, some uh, test some hypotheses. Like I'll, I'll make a mini comic based on an assumption uh, comic, a comic that mixes Doctor Strange spooky sorcery with Hello Kitty cuteness would be a viable comic. Let's make a mini comic, take it to shows, see how people interact with it. Oh, this one's getting more, sells more than this other one. So I can get some data on that. But still, there's a little bit of an assumption that I'm, I'm operating under. And when I feel like I've come up with an especially clever, interesting, or exciting solution to that problem... It can be intoxicating. It can feel like such a rush, such a high that, yeah, I'm creative, I'm innovative, and I found something, I found an approach to this that nobody else is doing. I found something that feels like I'm staking out territory that people are going to say, that's a Jersey Drozd comic, or that's a very Drozdian kind of thing to do in your comic, right? And then it, it makes contact with an organization, the ground, readers, and I get feedback saying, nope, it's, that's not what this needs to be. And that can be very difficult to manage and navigate because what I'm faced with then is, is here's the, the, the petulant part of my brain. Our brains are made up of lots of different people sometimes. Um, the petulant part of my brain says, well, what am I? Am I just like a work for hire slave who just makes what everybody else wants? Or am I a genius who brings the people what they don't know what they wanted yet? Right. Um, boy, it sure sounds like things are lining up so that I just am at everybody else's mercy and I have to just do what everybody else wants. And I don't get to bring my voice to this because nobody's interested in what my voice is on this. Right. Adaptability. Cause I've also existed in that in, in like adaptable spaces too, where like when I'm teaching, I'm trying to find out what the room needs from me. There are days when I get there and I'm like, the kids are show up, they're ready. They'll, they'll even, yesterday I was teaching a class that a kid said to me, this is so rare. He said, what can I do to make this better? <laughs> I was like, wow, you actually asked the question. You want to know how to make it better, you know? 
Uh, Because like often there's so much different kind of psychology going on. This kid just wants to be congratulated. This kid clearly needs some like uh, anger management going on. Like sometimes I'm more of a parental figure in the room than I am a comics teacher. And sometimes that could be frustrating, right? Sometimes it'd be like, well, gee, I thought I was here to teach comics. I guess I'm here to help you figure out how to manage your feelings, you know, in this moment. So, and in that space, I feel like adaptability asks me to sort of disengage with, detach from what I think my value is and embrace discovering what my value is, which it's not an easy story to contend with for me all the time. I wonder if you could respond to all those thoughts. Yeah, no problem. Well, I think we did a (laughs) podcast. (laughs) Anyway. No. uh, (laughs) Wow. It it is a conundrum. It is a conundrum. So like all of us, we study and get satisfaction with our particular skills and disciplines and you get a signal that you are skillful. And one thing that is really natural is to say, well, oh, I see in the world how I can help and I'm going to help. And and, and then you just, and and you want to get that, the, the acceptance and reinforcement of what you're providing. And that's a huge part of the story of an artist, I think. A huge part of the story of an artist is that, um, especially, I don't know, well, I, I don't want to say, like, I don't exist in all time frames, and I just know our culture, we're, my tiny little fuzzy perception of the time I exist and how um, there's the stories I've encountered, things like, you know, things like celebrated genius creators. There are celebrated geniuses in everything, right? So uh, people who run... Uh, just a portion of a business or who own a, a small business or, you know, we're trying to you know, like, we, we make reality TV out of that, like shark tank and all that stuff. We do. Um, we do that with artists too. And, and artists are, you're deemed successful. If you know, your, your voice is contributing to this thing that is dominantly you and it's labeled you, right? It's not like, you know, every one of us is standing on a whole system in history of tons and tons of other things and accomplishments, right? I know I didn't invent paper or the printing press or, you know, um, the language of comics or, or, you know, anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I just sure didn't invite in, invent, you know, um, smartphones, programming languages, you know, like on and I, and like, I didn't invent, uh, any of the tools in UX, <laughs> you know, like, um, so that I, but that act of the, the novelty and invention that is inherent in the celebrated voice of a creator. Um, yeah, that story is sure is out there and it's compelling. It's intoxicating. Like Mm -hmm. give me a bucket of that, that, Mm -hmm. and that experience where I'm that I'm the one I get to be the one. And it's, it's a, that sounds great. Um, Hmm. Also, um, that's, I, yeah, that's, that is a, uh, there is likely a, a personal trait that relates to the amount of adaptability, likely the amount of, uh, you know, the, that you could functionally adapt, but maybe you feel terrible at the end of the day. Um, like a, like an introvert who needs to, you know, convince a courtroom of something or whatever. I don't know. Like that might be really hard and expensive and cause it's so further, it's a, apart from where you want to be and how you feel naturally. Mm-hmm. That's probably expensive uh, emotionally. Um, because I don't think there's, so there is a, um, as I describe my personal excitement, I am full of uh, contextual privilege related to that. Uh, I did a, did I, I don't know if I, I've got so many polytechnic casts I've generated this month. I'm doing, I've got like the discard pile is, is huge this month. And I think on the discard pile is, is something related to um, introversion. No, oh. I do. I published that one. I did. I published that one. All right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I was just thinking through because I've made so many. I actually need to go. I've gone back some days and I'm like, which ones did I publish? Um, and so uh, where was I going with the introversion one? 
talking about like how it might be expensive to have to do something if you are introverted and you have to do like a big performance or have to do a lot of facilitation. Um, yeah. it, there, there's, there's different costs to being what the, the moment needs you to be. So, okay. Ah, right. Um, okay. And where I fall naturally in that, I somehow how have always, I like earlier in my, my, my life, I identified feeling pretty, pretty introverted or whatever, but that could just be life stage type stuff. And now I feel like an ambivert, what have you, um, where I don't mind the, uh, where I find my voice in the collaborative chaos is helping it be a functional less chaotic thing that that then unifies the voices and expression and beliefs and skills of everyone involved and i am naturally motivated to try to make that happen and not everyone is so because like literally this whole this someone might hear all that stuff about ux and be like nope um yeah, yeah. and then and be and i think part of that would be like is is are you a a creator of that the nature that says, well, I, I'm the voice and otherwise it's not as valuable to me and interesting and what have you. Um, I don't think there's a solution for that other than finding functional tools to, to solve problems if you want to. Um, but it's optional. Yeah. Because in some ways, so you have product market fit for th some things like your genius so here's the thing for, for if you're in that situation and I want you to succeed too, and I'm thinking systemically, uh, you got to generate a lot of stuff probably, probably because what you're trying to do is find the intersection of this point in time with your creative voice in that Venn diagram of uh, feasibility, viability, and desirability plus product market fit, mm -hmm. right? Because you can, you can have a, really airtight, um, strong, creative business hypothesis that uh, you can build it. It's feasible. Um, your audience likes it within the tests that you've done. It's desirable, right? Um, and it's it's viable where you're like, yeah, the products that exist in this space, I'm going to make a profit margin. All of it. Boom. Make it. Ship it, right? Uh -uh. Product market fit comes to get you. Yep. And uh, because that what that means is that so in the small... And in the right context, yep, your audience, it's working. But in the scale and the largeness, there it's 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 what it's not it's not reached a critical mass and it doesn't show a sign of that nat of that pattern panning out, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just I just wanted to, you know. <clears throat> and on the, with an acknowledgement of that that again to use that word tension because it's something that I, I I oscillate on a lot. I think I'm getting better at it. I think I'm getting better with having the sense of detachment from my ideas to to this to the extent that like I'm going to come up with a a, a reasonably well built hypothesis, but I'm going to let it go. And then once it's like if somebody decides to engage and trade on it, I'm ready to adapt it to what that. Uh, relationship requires hmm. right rather than try to force because I've, I've not met with much success with walking into the room with this sense of like I know what's right you know um, and I'm going to tell you all what's right, right? Uh, whereas where but there are situations where I've, I've had it, it, engaging in trade with other people where I've said well, well nope nope this is a line that you know um, I refuse to back down from. This is a non-negotiable point, you know? Like, in order for this mm -hmm. to be, if we all agree that this thing needs to be this, I feel very strongly it has to be this way. I'm not talking about being totally squishy, but not coming in with this force of, like, I've got the whole vision in my head and you're ready to receive it. Um, that's a tough one to let go of sometimes. Um, so. It really is. And so that's where, I mean, that, I mean, so we mentioned the, the four constituencies that you're dealing with, your users, your organization, your team, and you. And so as the, the uh, um, inspired voice of you as an artist personally, I mean, so you as an audience are actually really important there. And I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want to sound like I, I devalue this. Mm -hmm. I devalue it in a way that you're dealing with a more, um, a product that is inherently a, a system that behaves and acts and whatever, like, like a system of computing and, applications and all that stuff. I think that's a terrible idea to be you 
motivated in that situation. But, um, but when it comes to creative products where it's, it's about, um, you know, providing entertainment or edutainment and story and all that stuff. I mean, there's, uh, it, your, your voice, even in those systemic bigger products too, there's probably some slice of it that needs a, 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 a spirited voice that connects with the audience. And it doesn't, t- those don't come from typically a committee. Right. Uh, not as much, maybe, maybe a few, you know, folks collaborating, but it's not a, it's not like everyone from every discipline makes a great sounding um, creative voice. Right. When you mash them together. But that's a really cool question and problem that you shared. And I, uh, i I acknowledge that tension. Yeah. I don't know if what I shared was, well, was, I don't know how it landed with you, but no, no, I, I, I don't, I didn't, I wasn't looking for some kind of pat answer. I just wanted an acknowledgement of the, of the challenge and also the acknowledgement that, yeah, like, as you said, like this may not be, there might be people who say like, nope. Um, but I think it's worth acknowledging that there are multiple parties involved. And like you said, we are, we are not the inventors of the thing whole cloth. Um, so there's that acknowledgement as well. There's, there's, there's a lot of different, and, and that, that's not always super helpful to help me navigate those emotions in the, in the moment, but it's definitely a framework to help train me to disengage from it a little bit more easily, uh, down the road. If that makes sense. If, if there's a useful aspect of it, it's, is if hopefully there's a way to be creatively resilient that says the business part of your creative, your business part of your creative endeavor um, needs to encourage the, the expressive part of your creative endeavor to keep at it. And uh, because, because what you're doing there is you're doing, honestly, you're, you're doing some high stakes investment in a way. Uh, so you're, um, you're putting all your thought into one thing. Hopefully you can do that into a lot of things. And hopefully you're finding uh, some amount of learning in as far as um, like, well, thinking systemically about it because the idea of pitching a story and getting funded is, is one mechanism for financial success. But then there are other mechanisms for financial success that you can be exploring as well. So hopefully your, your business side of your endeavor is saying like, well, let's test a few hypotheses and see where we can get traction. And also it's it maybe testing different methods of the financial aspect of this project of this endeavor and also testing different creative products in the endeavor and all those permutations and seeing yeah. what takes off, which is a huge burden for an artist. But this is a huge benefit and possibility because we exist in this space where you can't tell the towers from the flowers. <laughs> I love that expression. All right. I think we did a podcast. (laughs) Uh, We did. (laughs) So we thank you for this one, Rob. This was fun. Uh, And we do this show. We stream it live on twitch.tv slash lean into art every Thursday around noon. And then we collect it as a podcast at lean into art.com and patreon.com slash lean into art. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then I have been Jersey Drozd of uh, leanintoart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com and I'm Rob Stenzinger on Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.